you have your Bibles this morning, would you take them and turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 this morning as we're going to continue in our series in the Gospel of Mark all the way to Easter. Would you take your Bibles and please stand as we read from God's Word. Mark chapter 9 beginning in verse 30. Then they departed from there, passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of men, and they want to kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. But then they will not understand this saying and be afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What is it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he will be last of all and servant of all. And then he took his little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we begin our time in your word, help us to see that the least shall indeed be the greatest. I pray, Father, this morning that your word will show us where we are in our relationship with you. Are you first, and are we putting others first? Guide and direct our mind and our thoughts, Father, as we hear from your word, and may your spirit speak to us, and we ask in your name, amen. You may be seated. In this text this morning, after delivering, if you're following along in chapter 8, the man of the unclean spirit, Jesus and his disciples pack up everything, and they departed their way and went through Galilee, it says, and ended up in a town called Capernaum. Let me tell you just a little bit about Capernaum. You'll see on the screen, these are actual pictures that we took on it, or we, some of us were on a trip, and I took some, uh, and I'll explain those in just a moment. But let's look for just a moment at the city of Capernaum. The synagogue on the right, uh, on my right, is actually a synagogue that was in biblical days. Uh, it's approximately 60 by 79. Many of you have traveled with me. We've actually walked in that synagogue there in Capernaum. Capernaum, as you see on the screen, is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee on the northern side. Jesus had just left over there by the word Hippos in that region, not necessarily right there, but they went back around the Sea of Galilee, ended up through going through Galilee, and then ending up in the city of Capernaum. Um, Capernaum was uh, on the north shore. Uh, it was the main city between Egypt and Babylon. It was a trade city. Uh, there was uh, not much there other than a small village, a small town, and you'll see that in the next slide. You'll see that the town is not very big. Uh, this is a, a picture on the left. Let me get that right. Yeah, on the left is actually a picture of Peter's house. We know that Peter lived there, according to archaeological studies. In 1968, they found what was known as Peter's house. Now, the the thing right above it is a museum that is built over the top. So on the right side, you can go up in the museum that looks down into Peter's house. That was found in 1968. Uh, it was a small village back then. And you, on the next slide, you'll see basically the width of the city. It's not very wide on the left. It's just a little small village. They estimate that between 1,200 to 1,500 people lived there back in biblical days. Now, to give you some perspective of that, it's smaller than all of the proximity of Landover Hills, but it has equal the number of people. Landover Hills has about 1,587 people, according to the last number that I checked. So you put all those people into a small area. Across that way, you're probably actually talking about an area that may be... Uh, may be I think I remember the dimensions of being about 2,000 feet by 2,000 feet. Small. Not very big. I mean, you're talking about our parking lot and our property, basically, and squeezing 1,500 people in. So that's where they went. Uh, it's an old city. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament, but it's mentioned 16 times in the New Testament. 
uh, second century temple on the, the right again uh, was where the people congregated, the Jewish people. You have to keep in mind, though, that this was Gentile area. This was an area where Jesus uh, preached more, did more miracles, did more signs, but yet it was a Gentile pagan area. And if you follow Scripture carefully, you'll find that he cursed that area as well because of their unbelief. Now, it's important to keep in mind as we move through these verses that Jesus sought unbelievers wherever they were, whether it was in Galilee, whether it was over in the Decapolis or wherever he was traveling, he sought to leave disciples to follow him. Now, when we go to the text this morning, I want us to see about three things. First of all, the disciples got into an argument. You see in verses 33 and 34 that they get into an argument. Let's look back at the text this morning. It says they came to Capernaum, and when he went into the house, he basically sat down, and Jesus said, what are you guys arguing about? That's pretty simple. They argued, but they didn't want to tell Jesus. Now, it says in the text, they came to the city, they sat down, and I, I love the way the King James Version puts this. It says they held their peace. <laughs> Can you think of an argument that you got into in which you didn't hold your peace? You just let it all hang out. Mark reveals that this debate, this argument, took place between the disciples as they journeyed to Capernaum. Now think for a moment. If you go back and you look at verses 30 to 32, you, see about, you hear about the squabble. They traveled through Galilee, it says, and Jesus was keeping really a, a basically a low profile. He was focused on his teachings and his disciples, and he told them that he would be betrayed, killed, and would rise three days later, verse 31. That's basically the Easter story, right? However, they were confused about this second prediction. This is the second time Jesus told them that he's going to go to the cross. The first one is in Mark chapter 8, verse 31 to 33. But as they journeyed, as they're on this trip around the Sea of Galilee, they have a time to talk among themselves, and the 12 of them really got into a discussion of who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be the best. You see, they were jockeying basically for positions. They wanted to know who could be close to Jesus, who could be the leader, who could be the one that could take over. They weren't concerned with his death. They were wondering about who's going to take over. And they didn't clearly understand what Jesus was getting ready to face. Keep in mind that Jesus had told them as they went around the Sea of Galilee towards Capernaum that he revealed for him, that he revealed to them his life, his mission, his purpose for all. Christ came to serve and to surrender to the Father's will. They missed that. But yet they got into a discussion, they got into a squabble. You ever get into a squabble when you were younger with one of your siblings? If you had a sibling or maybe two siblings or maybe three siblings, you got into a squabble and maybe it's in the back seat of the car when you're going somewhere and your mom and dad turn around and say, what are you guys arguing about? Nothing. It's that famous word, nothing. Nothing. You see, the disciples were in that same position. They were squabbling. And Jesus turned around and looked at them and said, what are you guys arguing about? What are you guys squabbling about? And they say, nothing. They literally said nothing. Notice their silence in verse 34. They held their peace. They were quiet. Even though they disputed or argued among themselves, who should be the greatest? And then we see in verses 33 to 34, we see that they arrive in Capernaum on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus asked his disciples to explain. He says, guys, tell me what you're arguing about. He had overheard them. Obviously, they hadn't realized that he was listening to everything they said. Maybe they were ashamed to admit that they'd been arguing about who, which one of them is going to be the greatest. Now, we know later in Scripture that a couple of them had their mom go to Jesus. You remember that story in that passage? Jesus, give my sons the proper places. If the disciples knew that Jesus would not have been pleased with their argument, so they, they refused to answer. They knew he wouldn't be pleased with what they were discussing because it detracted from what Jesus was all about. And while Jesus knew what was on their hearts, they spoke not a word. Not a word. Apparently they were convicted, or maybe they were ashamed knowing that Jesus rebuked them for their nonsense. 
I would never encourage disobedience, but the disciples were wise to let the argument end. There was no point in arguing with Jesus. You ever tried to argue with God? Let me tell you something. You lose every time. Every single time you will lose when you argue with God. Oh, but you say, I, I've got the, the, the right answer. Wrong. God is the answer. It's never wise to argue against the truth. It's never wise to argue against God. Our Lord has given His Word to guide us. If the Bible says it, it's plain, it's God's truth. There's no need to argue. There's absolutely no need to argue. What we need to do is submit to God's will and remain walking with Him. Otherwise, we, we become partners with disobedience. There's no other option. So the disciples got into an argument. They got into a squabble, and they didn't want to tell Jesus what it was all about. But then Jesus uses that in verses 35, 36, and 37 as an illustration to show them something. Let's look at it. Verse 35. He says, He sat down. He called the twelve together and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last and servant of all. Then he took a child, a little child, and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him into his arms, he said unto them, Whoever receives one of the little ones, little children, in my name receives me. We'll stop there for a moment. So this is a teaching moment for Jesus. This is an illustration where he has quality time with the 12 guys. He's going to hand over his ministry. The 12 guys he's going to entrust to fulfill his mission and his plan after he goes to the cross. This is quality teaching time in a small group. So Jesus sets them all down. He gives them an illustration. He gives them a, an explanation of what he's all about. Now, in verse 35, it's interesting to note Jesus' response. He didn't correct them. He didn't correct them for having a desire to be great. Rather, he corrected them with regard to the manner of becoming great. He, he, didn't, he didn't mix their, their ambition to be great. What he did was help them see how to become great, which is a big thing. Greatness comes by being a servant, he says to others, not by exalting yourself, not by saying, I'm the greatest, look at me. I can only think of one man that was really the greatest. Back in the 70s, I used to love to watch boxing. I used to love to watch Muhammad Ali. He would always say, I'm the greatest, and he was the greatest. At his day and time. But no man is great, only God. Greatness comes by being a servant, not elevating yourself according to your own standards. We must believe that God will honor our servanthood in eternity. That's what Jesus is doing. He sets the 12 down. I would imagine, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine commonly they set in semicircle. Maybe he went over and picked up a child, brought the child over, and just literally set it right down in front of them. How awkward that would that be for them? They're thinking, what in the world is Jesus going to do? We've seen him do so many different things. What is he going to do with this child? He did what he did for their benefit. And we see that playing out in Scripture. Now, in, in, in reference to their debate, Jesus, Jesus offered them really a startling truth, a truth. He declared that if a man wanted to be first in the kingdom of God, in the, ki in the kingdom work, he must be first willing to be last and submit to others. Twofold thing. Jesus says, you want to be great, you got to go to the back of the line. And you have to serve others. Now, sometimes we're okay with going to the back of the line. We don't care about serving others, though, sometimes, do we? The way to be used by God and to secure that, that great status in God's eyes is to go to the back of the line and be last and to serve others. You think of the life of Jesus that we've looked at in Mark chapter 1 through 8 already. Jesus was always putting himself under the submission of the Father. He was always serving and ministering to others. Greatness 
is secured through service, through serving others. It's inter interesting to note in the text that the word translated servant in our text is also the same word that's translated in the book of Acts, talking about deacons. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying deacons should all, all, only be the ones that are doing service. That refers to all of us. But the same word is used for deacons in the book of Acts. Those that are placed in a leader, place of leadership within the church, called to serve, not to lord it over the congregation, as Paul says. Servant leadership is modeled by Jesus. And he expects it out of his believers. If we're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and we say we want to be Christ-like, then guess what? We've got to model what he modeled. And what did Jesus model? Love, mercy, grace, peace, patience. The list could go on and on and on. But most importantly, he modeled serving, serving others. Now, look at verse 36 in the first part of that. It says he took a child and he sat in the midst of them. Jesus illustrated this point with a small child to show kindness to a child who nothing in return but served God. You see, greatness is not achieved through grandiose actions. It's not achieved through marvelous things that we do. It's achieved through lowly and unseen acts of service toward those who cannot repay those. But God sees, and God repays. As Jesus spoke to the disciples in this text of Mark chapter 9 to us this morning, he took that small child, not only did he put it in the center of the circle or the center of the disciples, but then he picked up that child. He picked up that child, and he continued to teach them. He continued to illustrate what service was all about. This was all done with purpose, as I read the book of Mark. Jesus would have used the example of a child to teach eternal truth to these men. I can just imagine Jesus holding that child, can't you? Can you just see the picture? Children were viewed in biblical days, as the lowest position of the social status. And that sounds really bad, doesn't it? See, they were dependent upon adults. They were dependent upon adults for their well-being. Children had to be served. They had to be taken care of. They were unable to do things for themselves. They could not be used for an advantage but yet they needed to be used and served like they had needs. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus is doing. He's holding the child. He's saying, we've got to become like children. Guarantee you the first time your parents and you bring home that baby, you don't walk into the crib and say, okay, you're on your own. Or maybe sometimes you do. I don't know. Okay, we got you into the world, but you're on your own now. You got one week of experience in this, in this cruel world, we're in, and you're on your own. Provide for yourself. We don't do that, do we? We nurture them. We teach them. We take care of them. We hold them. We, 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 we cherish them with love. And eventually, one day, they, they, they move out, right? They grow up, and they move out, and then they move back in, <laughs> and then they move out again. But they're helpless. Jesus was using a child to teach the principle of serving others. Now, look at verse 37 of the text. He gives us the explanation. Whoever receives such a child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. Now, who sent Jesus? God did. Jesus taught these men with this explanation. If they unwillingly submitted to a place of service, receiving and showing the hospitality to a child, then they understood it. But one who was unable to submit, one that was unable to submit themselves and offer anything in return, they missed it. Notice in the text in verse 37, he says, whoever receives, receives. 
By serving others, they not only serve Jesus, but they serve God the Father as well. That's what Jesus is teaching in verse 37. He's saying, if you, if you receive this child because of me, then you receive it not because of me, but because of God. See, it's all about relationship. In essence, these men were pleasing God, fulfilling His will in their lives as they served others. Let me ask you a question. Who are you serving? Who are you serving today? Are you at the back of the line serving others? Or the front of the line saying, hey, look at me. If you got that, hey, look at me, I'm in the front of the line mentality, you totally misunderstood what Jesus is saying. What did Jesus say he came to do? Seek and to save. Not to be served, but to serve. So we're going to be Christ-like. We're going to be Christ-like in every area, not just to pick and choose. Not in a multiple choice of A, B, C, and D, and maybe E, all of the above. It's everything. In everything that we do, Jesus taught these guys by holding a small child in his lap. Now, we live in a very selfish, competitive world. Would you agree to some extent? It seems like always we're, somebody's always trying to seek to that higher level, that higher position. We like to have our needs and our wants met, don't we? But Jesus is saying to have yourself as first is totally opposite of what I came to do. Now, when you look at this text, there's a passage in Matthew, I think it is, where Jesus continues this. Matthew kind of expand, expands on this. And there's a passage in there where Jesus says, if you do not serve and you do not cherish and understand this child illustration, it's as if you put a millstone around your neck. Now, a millstone, I don't have a picture of it, but a millstone is a large stone, larger than this pulpit, that they would use to roll around with a donkey, and they would crush olives. It weighed four, five, six, seven, eight hundred pounds. Jesus is saying it's better for you to wear one of those around your neck. If you don't understand the principle of serving. You see, Jesus revealed a great place to start. We can always make ourselves available to others. Always. The third thing, if you look at verse 38, Jesus brings great clarity. He brings great clarity to the disciples in verses 38 to 41. Here Jesus offers a clarification in regard to the attitudes of the disciples toward others. Now, notice in verse 38, John answered saying, Master, we have saw one casting out devil in your, devils in your names, and fo he followeth us not. We forbade him because he followeth not us. Now, Jesus had just taught them about serving. Keep that in mind. And John makes an assumption here. Evidently, in this section of Scripture, John becomes the spokesman. He becomes the spokesman for the disciples this time. They, they were really offended because they saw this guy casting out demons in Jesus' name, but they didn't follow him. He wasn't following him. Now, when you read this text, Jesus admitted that he and the others had rebuked the man for casting out the demons because he was not part of their group. John assumed, basically, John assumed that he wasn't one of the disciples. He was just using Jesus' name. And Jesus takes him to task in his this, in this verses. Look at, look at verse 38. John said and answered him, saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives us, who gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to him, by he by no means will lose his reward. Now, Jesus was teaching them about serving. And here, all of a sudden, John says, hey, well, that guy over there, he's not one of us. And I think the principle is that Jesus is saying, 
He is one of us, even if he doesn't follow me right now. We know that John loved Jesus, and he was always looking out for the best of Jesus. But this particular time, his heart was not in the right place. And this attitude remained prevalent in John until Jesus had this conversation with him. Now, we tend to criticize and condemn things, and we need to be careful about that. And what John is saying here, or excuse me, what Jesus is saying here is, just because they're not part of us doesn't mean that he's not doing my will. Now, when we look at this passage, Jesus in verse 39, he, he, he wanted to remind John, and I think remind us, that we need to be admonished sometimes for the way that we treat other people. Believers, non-believers. But notice what Jesus' affirmation is in verse 40 and 41. For he who is not against us is on our side. Whoever gives a cup of water in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, King James says, he shall not lose his reward. Whoever is not against us is for us. Trust me, Jesus had a lot of people against him at that day and time. He broadened the scope and the principle of servanthood. He affirmed that those that were not working against Jesus were actually working for him, is what Mark tells us. He declared that all that gave a cup of water in his name, revealing who they belonged to. Jesus was saying that although their approach may be different, the same end is achieved. Just because others are different doesn't mean that God's not working through them. Here, I think, is what we need to understand about this passage. I'm convinced that we're oftentimes more like the disciples than we want to admit. We often want to try to tell God how to do things. We often want to tell God, we want to be the greatest. We often tell God, well, they're not doing it the same way we're doing it, so they must not belong to you. That's not actually accurately true. So we often act more like the disciples, don't we? I pray that God would teach us to go to the back of the line and serve others. Because that would become great. Not that great is one of the achieving things on your goals, your task list, or whatever it is, but to be great in the kingdom of God, we have to go to the back of the line and serve others. Serve others. And Jesus taught this using an illustration of a child. Who is it that you need to serve today? Who is it that you need to assist, help, in whatever way in which you feel led by the Lord. But I'm convinced we're often more like the disciples in many of these other passages of Mark and others than we really want to admit. And maybe we just need to sit down and spend some time with Jesus and let Him refresh our minds and refresh our souls and refresh our spirits that serving to become the greatest means to become the least the least. Let's pray. Father, this morning, in just a moment, we'll sing an invitational hymn. And I pray, Father, that we indeed would listen to your voice to speak to us with clarity about who indeed is the greatest. Number one, you are the greatest. You indeed are the greatest of all time. Father, may we place ourselves last. And may we serve others. Today, Father, may be any number of needs represented here this morning as we sing our imitational hymn, Only Trust Him. That's really what it's all about. It's trusting You. Trusting You with our needs, our wants, our desires. Trusting You with our life. 
our service, our faithfulness. So Father, if we want to be great, help us to understand we have to be least. If we want to be great, remind us that we need to serve others. And serving others comes in many, many different facets. But Father, help us see where we fit in serving others. So Father, you speak to our hearts. And may your Spirit speak to us clearly that if we need to come and pray, to find a place to just turn our life over to you, to commit ourselves to you, to readjust our priorities, would we be obedient to step out and say, here am I. Here am I, Lord. I'm just here to trust you. So, Father, speak to our hearts today, and we ask this in your name. Amen.